What's going on, Workforce? Brian here. Chris here. And today we're talking about uh, kind of really everything that's been going on in the YouTube spectrum for the last two weeks. This obviously kicked off at the beginning of June. And then just last week, CNET kind of did a like a hit piece on several uh, YouTube channels, namely the quartering, uh, you know, uh, downward thrust, upper echelon gaming, uh, clean prints gaming as well. And basically we ha had a lot of thoughts on it. Chris and I've been talking about it. We actually reached out to Jeremy and he accepted a, a meeting, but we haven't, <laughs> he, did, he did a no show. And, uh, and so we don't know if we just need to reschedule that, but what well, we wanted to sit down today and really kind of look at kind of the article uh, what was said, what we have problems with, with the CNET article, but also what we feel is a little bit of both sides kind of saying the same sort of story, selling the same thing maybe to their base and talk about, you know, the, the challenge of YouTube, the challenge of echo chambers, the challenge of what we would, uh, I guess, consider traditional games media in this case. And as it relates to the YouTube algorithm, uh, so there's a lot to unpack here and hopefully we'll be able to get, you know, Jeremy on to kind of share his thoughts uh, and his reaction, and obviously that being that there's been a little bit of time since this article has come out, but we, we kind of broke it down and like it, we have several quotes uh, like from the article and we have a lot of information, namely that like when I went and looked at the numbers for Jeremy, and I'm going to toss to Chris here in a second, um, this article only did good things for the quarter link. Like on average, just for the numbers, he was at 432 uh, subs a day on average. Uh, going into this, afterwards, he is now at 1654 subs a day on average, which is a 282% increase in his subscriber base. From a view perspective, he was averaging around 390,000 views a day, and now he's up to 551, 52,000 views a day, which represents a 42% increase in viewership from the CNET article. So there's, it's interesting because if the if the goal of the article the scene an article was to hurt these youtubers because like it's up all over the board echelon clean prints and uh you know downward thrust like over across the board this was great for them outside of the fact that he this uh, the, the author went out and specifically targeted advertisers to get them to pull chris like there's a lot to unpack here i want to i'm gonna let you share your thoughts because yeah. Word choice is really important here so like targeted advertisers i don't think is a fair categorization okay um, when a journalist researches an article, it is it is common to the point that it's cliche for them to say, reached out for comment, they said no comment or have not yet responded. When we see journalism, a lot of times what they do is they reach out to sources to further do things. So when you're investigating why YouTube is a certain way, whether or not your premise is faulty, and, and that's a whole different part of this, one of the things you would do, any journalist would do, is you would say, okay, how how is this possible? Okay, it's being paid for by advertisers. What makes those advertisers associate with this type of content? Why do they pick YouTube? Do mm -hmm. they pick because it's really um, it's really cheap or it's really effective or they really like you know being associated with it? Like, what is that reasoning? And so, of course, you would reach out to them and you would reach out to them and you'd say, hey, I'm writing a story that's finding these things what is it about that that appeals to you? And so that would be very natural. Now that doesn't have to be, um, you know, how that's presented to that advertiser can be very different. This particular author seems to have done a lot of things where um, even in his article, he, he writes things like YouTube memberships. Mm -hmm. And when you put something in quotes, it, it, it when it's not a direct quote, like somebody talking, it does make it look like, um, you know, like I have a point to be made. And so it just kind of, it makes light of something and it, it almost talks down about memberships. And if this were memberships where I was repackaging something, like if I was, so in my drawer here, I keep a bunch of batteries, right? Okay. I buy them from Amazon. Now, if I sell this individual pack here, that's not for resale, I'm selling batteries. That's what it makes it sound like. It makes mm -hmm. it sound like I'm, it's something less than official, but it's not less than official. You are paying a very legitimate company, Google, for a very legitimate service with very real money that's being processed and tracked and taxed and all these things. Um, and, and you're supporting a very real piece of content that is unique and individual and is guarded against copyright and all these things. So like I, he tends to look down on YouTube under the premise that 
I guess he's more official because he's at CNET, which is associated with like CBS and because he's a chief editor over like a, a team that that's somehow better, that more people makes you better. And then the alternative side of that is, well, does less people make you better? Like that doesn't mean that YouTube suddenly, oh, well, I'm more authentic because it's just Brian and I like, no, the size of your publication has nothing to do with your authenticity. But doesn't that, uh, when you bring up size and authenticity, doesn't that essentially what the, the science shows where people see those numbers, those likes, and there's a communal aspect that that number makes somebody more authentic or more legitimate than anything else? Like if you go and add 1 million to our subscriber base, doesn't that, uh, isn't there a risk in that people then looking at that number and, and applying that, oh, these guys must know what they're talking about because there's a large number associated with them. And we see this on both sides because you could see that somebody, and we I saw this on uh, Twitter not too long ago, is that there was a YouTuber who has like 600,000 subscribers um, and he's not listed in anything we're talking about, but people will discount him because he's not at 1 million or 2 million. And it's like, your opinion doesn't matter until you reach a certain threshold it doesn't matter what your opinion is but i'm going to discount it regardless of what you say what your facts are what your evidence is uh you know <laughs> to to the point like that's where like when when you're talking about cnet like in this case it's like that's where like is this guy flexing like on youtube like we're legit like we we have all these uh standards we have some form of journalistic quote-unquote integrity or uh, you know, some form of like buy-in, right? Where it's like they've- I mean, there's that same quote unquote, right? Like yeah. you're making, it is journalistic integrity. It's not It's not a quote, it's not a metaphor, it's not a simile. It is It is a set standard that sticks to the definition of integrity. Mm -hmm. a, the journalistic integrity is a, a documented thing and it may not be state regulated like medical or architecture or law, but it is, there is a body of, of media professionals that in, that that's, plan to stick to and intend to stick to and hold each other to a set of principles by which, you know, you see, you see left and right sides of media stick up for one another when they stick to their principles. So if freedom of the press and things like this are protected by them as a whole, um, and they see that that comes with a set of responsibilities. Do they have bias? Yes. But do they have the right to ask questions? Yes. Do they have the right to pre present facts? Yes. And if a journalist goes out and is, is abusing that and is not researching their facts, not um, you know disclosing sources when that's appropriate, um, then they tend to get blackballed by that industry. So does YouTube have that? Does YouTube have any barrier to entry? I love YouTube. But like, is there any barrier to entry? I don't have to show my face. Mm -hmm. I don't have to show game footage. There are vid YouTube videos out there that are just audio. The other side of it is there are YouTube videos out there that are just slides playing. So it doesn't require audio. So what makes YouTube quality? Like I can do it with my phone. I, I can do it at age five with no education. I, I can do it at age 90 with no understanding of the internet. I, I There is no requirement of age, education, credibility. There is very little liability. What makes a YouTuber deserving of not being criticized by an outsider? No, I think the thing is that to say that we would say we don't want to be criticized, that's an individual level. I would think the, we, we should always embrace, uh, I would say critique more than criticism because criticism in my mind is just the discounting and dismissal without actually looking at the uh, the argument or the like what they're actually saying so it'd be like chris is wearing a white shirt i'm like whatever he says is ridiculous i'm done that's like criticism Criti chris is an idiot because he wore a white shirt today as opposed to the critique is you know where you're like okay like this is what he said here's the here's the issues with it here's where we disagree and here's like and, and you draw and you take the 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 reader or the viewer on that journey and whether they end up on with the same conclusion as you that the, the goal is ideally to seek understanding so that a at the end of the journey whether you agree or disagree you should understand better the, who, the who's presenting the information on how they came to the conclusions they came to and whether you're going to come to those same conclusions especially when everything completely relates to something that is objective which is the opinion is this game good or bad like you can present like here are the technical issues, here's the visual fidelity, here's the here's what the game is, and here's the experience you can expect 
playing it, but when it comes down to, was this a fun game, a good game, something that you're going to enjoy, that's going to vary. Because like, and evidence of this is always in <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder, because you look at several games that are persistent and hugely popular. Uh, same thing with movies, like these just blockbuster movies, and then they never get nominated for anything. Uh, or they're like, ah, oh, that's just a seven. It's a seven with like, you know, 40 billion people playing it and have, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and having a blast with it. So like that is where I think things, for me, get a little bit uh, like tricky. So I think that we should always invite critique. I think you, uh, I think it's in the, the person who is then providing that critique to present it in a way that is, is consumable telling somebody just like you're an idiot or, or going like at the core of it, like what was the objective here? Go, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. One more do time. You, do you think popularity determines influence? I think that's the simple equation that a lot of people relate to. I, I don't think it does. Do you think that, that I don't think it does. I think when you that's what you're saying, if 40 no, million people is good, right? No, that's not what I said at all. Uh, <laughs> I said I said that it's like when people are like when you're rating a game and rating something that is that is essentially objective whether a game is good or bad. You know, it's like that is something that some every individual is going to come down to it. So you could sit here and say like there's this really large game and it was and it scored poorly and that's where a lot of the dr like drama will come into or people are like no I rated that game a 10. It's it's a, it's perfect. It's awesome. I play it every day. But somebody might play it and be like, yeah, it's not really for me, but this is where I fall on the spectrum. It doesn't matter how many people are playing it or not. Same thing goes with like a very niche game, like that's typically ignored, where it's like maybe the reviewer doesn't even understand the fan base uh, of why people like that game. And so then they feel discounted when they come in with like a five. Like it, like I honestly think maybe even the whole point of this and kind of where this started, we'll jump into uh, kind of the history of where this we believe started because we were because <laughs> we don't know a hundred percent but like this all started with a review like a i think reviews fundamentally are flawed you know like they they serve a purpose people are interested in it people obsess about the score because they look to see if the score nowadays in my opinion uh if the score J it validates their own personal view does this score line up with what i was thinking and if so yes I agree with this person, this person like influence that relationship, that endearment of the, of the community to the, that of the creator or the author of an article where on the flip side, if it doesn't agree with it, you end up having a situation in which that this person is just a hate filled, uh, you know, monger, the angry gamers of YouTube, like the whole, like my whole premise. And we were talking about like going into this week is that I don't think clean prints, the quarterling, upper echelon uh i don't think the premise of this guy's article kind of states that they are creating this angry gamer culture on youtube i think gamers are angry and these guys inadvertently or or <laughs> like just said hey there's a market people are angry they want to feel heard they want to find a way that they can go and have a community where things are going on it's the simple premise that you don't want to make a product and then go find a market to sell it to you, you find a market and then you make the product for that market. And thus the market is that I think that gaming and gamers in general over the course of who knows, like let's just arbitrarily pick 10 years, uh, have grown increasingly frustrated, increasingly uh, discounted. Um, they, they have fond memories of how gaming used to be. Gaming is no longer that. Why is that the case? And thus you enter into the field where, where uh, guys like Jeremy, uh, with, you know, like the, the whole thing come and all that's of a sudden fill the need. Go ahead. That, that's not unique to gaming. No, this is uh, not. Everybody and this says, is, everybody says, you know, when I was a kid, things were better. When I was a kid, kids in school were more respectful of their parents. When I was a kid, like it, it what that has in common was you were a kid. Mm -hmm. like, obviously, time was better when you weren't paying rent when you didn't have a boss, when you didn't have to pay bills, like it inherently was better when you were younger. And as you got older and you took on responsibilities, life got more complex. Now in trade for those responsibilities, you got good things. But when you're saying, when was it better? You go, wow, back then, 
when I had 10 good things and no bad things, that was a way better ratio than now where I have 50 good things, but then I, I have to carry all these bad things to go with it. I have a house that I can decorate. I have a whole room dedicated to video games. Mm. I didn't have that as a kid, right? but I have rent due. Like <laughs> a mortgage company. You have bills to pay. Purchase this house. And if that water heater breaks over there, you got to fix it. Deal with that. Uh, and so like there, there's a cost to it. And, and so, you know, what's interesting about this article is that the way he researched it, mm-hmm. he does it, he fundamentally didn't understand the algorithm. So he was a YouTube. So basically this guy was a, a tech writer is now over gaming, a logical progression for a career and is, you know, noticing that there's some negative channels. So he decides I'm going to go research this, right? And he tweets out things, been watching a lot of YouTube lately. And so you can go follow his Twitter feed as he descends into the madness. <laughs> says, you know, okay, so he goes to watch YouTube and he decides I'm going to go see what all the hype's about. So he clicks on a video, right? I'm going to go click on one of these videos that has all the views. Now he's doing what people are doing subconsciously, but he's intentionally driving it. So Mm -hmm. he's further leaning into the algorithm. He's saying, show me the most polarizing stuff. So he clicks on one and what does he do? He researches it. Well, how do you do that? You take quotes. Okay, so I'm sitting here and I'm writing it down. Well, what's happening in the background? I'm giving that video watch time. Wow, I wonder who sponsored this video. Oh, well, I need to go find that out. So what am I going to do? I'm going to write down the pre-roll. I, mm. Well, a pre-roll didn't happen that time because not every view gets a pre-roll. Uh, I know in our, our case, it fluctuates what percentage of our views in a month get a pre-roll. Right. Because YouTube does not sell an ad against every view, right? Because the most money isn't made off of selling the ad to the total number of views, it's off the most money. So selling 50 ads at a premium price is better than lowering the price to the point where you can fill all 100 slots. So, you know, so what do you do to see ads? What ads? You refresh the video. Mm -hmm. And you refresh it, and you refresh it, and you refresh it. And the only thing better than somebody watching one of my videos for the algorithm to show that they like it would be if they watched it over and over and over and then what do they do well i wonder if this guy's always like this let me watch and take quotes from a bunch more of his videos right. and a bunch more people like him let me go pursue an entire genre of people and feed them watch time okay awesome so he does this for several weeks and then he ba- or even just a day i thought gosh if i do this for two hours it affects what my algorithm does and it takes it forever to self-correct okay now i'm done researching for this article so I'm going to go home and I'm just going to watch whatever Bon Appetit light, you know, happy thing I was going to watch. It's nowhere to be found in my feed because the algorithm says, hey, we think you love people who are upset at gaming right now. Yeah. So not only are we going to show you people who are traditionally upset, but like we have people come into our videos. We have 1500 videos on this channel, the vast majority of which are positive, excited or are, are meant to be educational. Mm-hmm. The vast majority. And yet they'll say all the videos from you guys are negative. Well, if you like negative videos, YouTube is very good at cherry picking out all of our individual bad videos and putting them in a playlist just for you. And so if you if you feed it long enough, you can watch all eight of our terribly negative videos back to back. Mm -hmm. Well, not just ours, but others. So it's like it all gets grouped in. It's like that's the thing. It's like, oh, all you do is post negative videos. Okay. I think yeah. maybe all you do is watch negative videos because after 1600 videos, if eight of ours are like definitely negative, guess what? You know, it's that's probably, bad. that's all, that's all you're going to see on your homepage unless you go to our video tab and you're like, oh, da, 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 which you're not really going to do. Cause when, I mean, the numbers show themselves, everybody really comes in from the main page. Like you, you, the, the, the least amount of clicks is what you, the YouTube algorithm prefers. If it doesn't have, you don't have to jump through hoops. That's it doing its job. I want to read a quote to you real quick Yeah, from the article. It says, Welcome to 2019, where some influential gamers on YouTube have learned what many others, including the President of the United States, which is a weird kind of tie-in, honestly, we'll talk about it, uh, have figured out. Anger sells, it sells big. Uh, for me, this seems like a really weird statement. A, like, okay, like, obviously, I think that there's some, like, kind of, emo- he's trying to relate some emotion so that if you don't like the un- the president, like, if you fall politically 
in that realm, it automatically yeah. sets the narrative that these YouTubers, I don't know where they fall politically, but like in my mind, it's like, I felt like he's phrasing that in a way that it's like, if you are, if you do not like president Trump, guess what? You're not going to like these guys either. And starts to say, kind of set that mindset. What What's your take here? Cause it's like, so if we, before, like without going into politics, without talking about policy, mm -hmm. if we just look objectively at the marketing strategies and the communication strategy that President Trump chooses to take on, regardless of the message mm -hmm. and, and the language and the word choice and things like that. And then we look at the word choice of the people that the president critiques, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fake news. So if we just look at these two things in this relationship, you have a set of people creating what they feel in their own view is unbiased content. And then you have somebody with a larger platform criticizing them for that content. And, and so, and they make all of their money off of clicks and views. And this person is established regardless if they get views and gets views because they're established. Mm -hmm. So in this quote, they equate us to being the president, but in this scenario, he's the president. And the funny thing about that is like, the president will sometimes point at a critic who has a very small following, much like this article will point at a YouTube channel that has a small following. And I am saying the quartering is small because there are over 8,000 channels with over a million subscribers. And yet every channel he picked had under 700,000. Mm -hmm you picked a you picked you you didn't pick the fox news the cnn the abc of youtube you didn't pick the largest channels you didn't go after the traditional targets like pewdiepie you went after the next step down which which are still established things right mm -hmm. so the huffington post breitbart all of those things where opinion tends to bleed out a little more because they're not as established so they tend to be a little more echo chambery so you picked the next tier down which is where we trade sometimes authenticity for relatability, right? We trade that, you know, total research, unbiased, has a crew for this one man shop who I appreciate his views and I view him as a friend and I tune into him like I do a radio show host on my way to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that he chose that and then he gave this guy a platform. So he said, you know what's awful about YouTube? There's all these negative, negative channels out there and they're all getting an audience. So I'm going to write an article and give them an audience. Like, I mean, you took note of what this did to their subscribers and their views. Yeah, I mean, it only bolstered them. That's the same thing. Like, it, it the these these somewhat smear attacks. Like, we could look at it from anything. Tend to where people were like, okay, like, oh, thanks for pointing me in that direction. I'm going to go check it out. Oh, it's not unreasonable like their opinions aren't either like that might not agree or whatever it's just it's truly weird because ultimately i question what is their objective is there was their objective to bolster the like if they're if, if he's saying that these are what's wrong with youtube which it really comes down to it he, he kind of hits on it that uh he says it's youtube that picks it's youtube that picks the top results when you search and it's youtube that recommends the next video that you watch that automated software is responsible for more than 70% of overall time spent on YouTube. The New York Times reported it's nothing. Uh, it draw uh, it, the New York Times reported, noting it's drawing accusations of leading users down rabbit holes filled with extreme and divisive content in an attempt to keep them watching to drive up the site's use numbers. But then, what does his article do? It shows him researching by diving down the rabbit hole himself, mm -hmm. and then pointing people to the rabbit hole. I think it's a fundamental under, misunderstanding of actionable in his, he says he understands it, but then he falls right into it. I wish we could see CNET's numbers from this. Like, you know, at the end of the day, like I like seen as CNET playing to their base, right? Like are people going out and then, Oh my gosh, like I can't stand YouTube because of X, Y, and Z. And thus, yes, I'm going to make sure that I, I subscribe to, to whatever, like beyond the subscription numbers, Jeremy has used this to drive memberships, to drive all of this financially, I think he might be, and he's even, I think, confirmed it that he's in better shape than he's ever been because of this hit piece uh, of an article. And it's weird to call it a hit piece. It literally sounds like I would call it a trumpet, a, a, a call to a call it to subscribe. What's up? It was empty on its own. Mm -hmm. The piece didn't do that much. It said, "Did you know the internet has negative things and that algorithms drive traffic?" 
that's all it did. It was an empty piece. Mm -hmm. It was tweets associated with it and the tone that he took that, that created a hundred percent of the problems. He chose to treat YouTubers like children and then got mad when they slapped back. Mm -hmm. he chose to tweet out his, his tweets made it, made him look more childish, which made him an even easier target. Cause I didn't feel like, Oh, well, Anderson Cooper did a deep dive on me. So what am I gonna do? It's like, no, some, some guy at CNET who comes across as some guy, you mm. can go look up his LinkedIn profile. He has, he has enough on there to tell me that he should know better, but he comes across as some guy, he comes across a lot lower in standing than he actually is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the theory that we have and what we were hoping to ask Jeremy is that, that originally this kind of like, it feels like it was sourced because CNET has a relationship with game uh, GameSpot. Um, mm -hmm. Jeremy did a, I, I mean, for since he's not here to, to defend himself, uh, I would say a hit piece on uh, uh, Plague's uh, review of Days Gone. The thing that personally just lost me in his interview uh, or his review of or his breakdown of that is that when he said he hadn't played the game yet. Like, he, he was calling into question her time with the game, her opinion of the game, um, <laughs> for any number of reasons. But then it's like, because he was under the impression that the game would at least have a certain score. Like, he, in his mind, prejudged the game to be like, it, it's going to be at least a, an 8. And then when it didn't come in at that, when it had technical issues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then he chose to, like, pick apart this, rather than going and playing the game and then picking apart the review. That's literally, for me, where I was like, okay, dude, like, why why does this video exist like you're picking apart hers and saying that you haven't played the game yet and i think that's where a lot of this kicked off the the theory obviously we don't have it in fact but the th the feeling at least is that obviously this is what somewhat sparked or unite uh, started the 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 like well, who is this guy and so then they said go look at this guy and then the algorithm started just recommending all this thing and then it's like either a light bulb's going off at cnet saying do you Oh my gosh, there are these negative uh, or perceived negative YouTubers. I just say they're 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 feeding to their base. Like if we go make a non Final Fantasy fourteen video, it's going to do okay, but it's not going to anywhere near do what a Final Fantasy fourteen video could do or would do on this channel. And so it's to say that uh, we we could say we could have confirmation bias and say obviously people don't like Borderlands three. Or <laughs> maybe based, based, on our, based on our primarily Final Fantasy audience, not liking one video one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the, that's what I feel that, that kind of this comes down to the conclusion of is that, oh, I, I made a video, a positive video and nobody watched it. I think people are angry and then people were associating that with it. I, I, I'll go as far as to actually say this is that I, I, it, I think your perception of Clean Prince, the Quarterling, Upper Echelon, and uh, and a downward thrust all depends on whether you agree with their opinion or not. If they come out and say EA sucks, Activision sucks, uh, uh, you know, like all like oh yeah yeah, but then all of a sudden if they step into like I didn't like this about this one game, oh yeah, all of a sudden when the the viewer and the creator have a difference of opinion that can fundamentally shift overall, and I think we've seen that. Like, you see that in real time. It's like, oh, okay, like, I used to like them, but then, like, we disagreed. And I think that's one of the real uh, concerns that I have for YouTube. Because to say that YouTube is this, like, perfect playground isn't. I think YouTube is great at growing echo chambers and something that we actively strive to not do in a way that I know that some uh, people communicate this to us on a regular basis that then says they don't like that content. Like, how could, like, oh, I thought you guys were this. Like, the, the number of people who tell me to stay in my lane grows exponentially, but that's, and I respect them for their opinion, but at the end of the day, you know, YouTube is really good. The algorithm is really good at finding things that, have, that don't challenge you, that, you know, unless you actively seek out things that are, like, challenging in that discussion. But, you know, the number of people who don't like discussion videos, but also just want to be told that, like, everything's good, they're right, you know, that reaffirms their belief, is what I would see as concerning. I don't actually look at these guys as negative posters because they post a lot of different content. If they you do. only engage with one fraction of that content, uh, that is what it is. Like, Clean Prince of Gaming posted that he's, like, he says he's got... A strategy in his positive content and his negative content. Obviously, his negative content does far better for him 
than anything else. And it's just like people are more apt to do like to engage with it one of two ways, in my opinion, to come in and agree or to come in and disagree. If something says like, oh, everything's really, oh, this is really fun. Somebody might see the thing, the thumbnail and be like, oh, that's good to know and move on with their lives. But if all of a sudden that thing challenges you to say, this sucks, you're going to go, hell yeah, it does. Or you're an idiot and I'm going to find any way that I can to discount you. I'm going to, I'm going to say that you're like, you don't have enough subs. So like, yeah, what do you know? You don't have 10 million subs. Okay. Oh, what do you know? You know, you're wearing a white shirt or what do you know? You know, it's like, You'll find a way to try to discount the opinion. And so I think what we've lost when we look at this, the, this, this article, right? Like, I think all these people are doing are just volleying back and forth. I don't think they're in cahoots to sit here and say like, hey, how can we make you grow and how can we make us grow? But honestly, I think we've lost the ability to have dialogue with the invention of the ability to communicate better than we've ever had before. I think that's what yeah. this boils down to. I mean, and there's something interesting about the way these algorithms work and the way a base works, right? So, like, like Boogie Toon, Boogie has an enormous number of subscribers, mm -hmm. but it is not seven billion people. So it's not the entire world. It's not even the entire world that speaks English. It's not even the entire world that could find him interesting. It's not even the entire world that, that it has ever been interested in a topic he's covered. It, it's nowhere close to the size of any of those markets. Yeah. Um. So. Boogie said, hey, YouTube reached out to me and said, hey, you know, you've been doing this negative content and in your negative content, he has, you know, his alternative personality that he comes out with and and he rants and raves and, and he uses a lot of cuss words and he uses a lot of foul language and things like that. It's not very advertiser friendly. And um, and that's not really YouTube asking. It's not like, oh, we made up the rules on what's advertiser friendly. It's like, mm -hmm. no, no. The advertiser saying they don't want to do it. Right. Yeah, advertiser friendly is the term we're using to describe that. Uh, and so they don't want their product associated with you shouting the F word sorry like and that i mean that's that's literally all youtube's doing mm -hmm. and they're not they're not defending boogie they're not saying oh well the f word's not as bad as you think so maybe they should be and they're not telling the advertisers hey you know so they're just relaying the information as far as i can tell and right. they're using not to be in between they just want the money and um <laughs> oh, whoever pays us uh and and so boogie said well I, i'm gonna go take it was like seven or ten days or whatever and i'm gonna make positive videos so he goes and he does that and then he says it crushed my numbers well you've built a base of like three million plus subscribers that love you shouting the f word at the screen which means that anybody who came in here and doesn't like that didn't subscribe and stick around mm -hmm. so this entire base that you could have built around positive con content doesn't exist this is before you even factor in the fact that human nature the audience probably is larger for negative content but either way you didn't build positive content because to say it's not viable on the platform says that game theory isn't viable mm -hmm. says that Vlog brothers isn't viable says that veritasium isn't viable says that vsauce one two and three is not viable like there are so many advertiser friendly things that good can, mythical morning yeah. like yes there are tons that are just crushing and they are so advertiser friendly that they are being offered to you see um gosh i'm drawing a blank on her name uh, she was in like a Google ad, like you, you see even Hannah Hart, who really got big drinking on camera <laughs> and still found a way to remain relatively advertiser friendly. And so it, it's not even like you can't cover the subject. The whole premise of her video is I'm going to get hammered and do unsafe things in a kitchen. That's the get go. And yet that has found a way to be marketing friendly. So like, it's really just how far are you willing to bend um, you know, so if, if you look down and you say, okay, like Brian and I like a lot of games, mm -hmm. I like final fantasy. I like world of Warcraft. I'm not really a fan of some of the BFA content currently, but as a whole, um, I like Diablo games. I like, uh, I like elder scrolls games. And so if one of them called me up and said, Chris, we'd like to pay you X thousand dollars a month to play our game. That's not a hard ask for me. And I'm not, I don't feel I'm selling out my values to play that game instead of 14 because I, I don't like 14 so much more than them that I wouldn't rather play that game and get thousands of dollars because I could also then at that point do things like not work as much. I could just focus on only playing video games. That's way better. And so like, that's an easy ask. And so when, when CNET comes in and says like these YouTubers are just chasing the money, well, within their realm of influence, it's not like I'm saying, oh, well, I would also start a makeup channel for money. 
No, I wouldn't. Like, I'm not. I'm not gonna go do something <laughs> I didn't want to do. I'm staying only in my lane. Yeah. You're just, like, if I have five doors in front of me and one of them pays me, or if one of them is easier, or if one of them seems more fun, or whatever my priority list may include, I'm gonna pick the door that lines up with the most things. And so, if you choose to be a professional YouTuber or a professional streamer, a streamer, money has to be on that list. It has to be. Uh, and so when he says, well, they just chase views and they just chase anger and concern and, and money. Yes, but like only from the standpoint of like, Jeremy had 10 things he wanted to talk about that day. And one of them he knew would draw his audience. It's not like he went off and invented outrage. Right. It's not like he just started making up stories. When he talks about a game coming out and saying something stupid, it's because the game came out and said something stupid. Do you think I, negativity I is a problem on YouTube? I think it's a problem with humanity mm -hmm. and I think it's a natural evolutionary trait. So we're trying to unevolve thousands of years of what kept us around. Yeah. We were in a, if we were in a tribe of 20 people and one guy died from eating a plant, it is important that my brain stores that more importantly than that you really like raspberries. <laughs> because one of those is going to keep me alive. Yeah. And so that should be stored. They say that ratio is one to 10, but yes, it's some ratio. The one that kills me should be more important in my brain than which ones taste delicious. Um, so like, I think negativity is a problem in general. And I think that when money gets involved, I mean, it was the late 1800s when, when newspapers started getting in a market for trying to be privately run and, and make a lot of money at it. Mm -hmm. And when they started a lot of money on it you had a whole generation of of yellow of the yellow papers right where they just and they got to the point where they were putting out like unsubstantiated stuff they were just like it was basically tabloids just go nuts it's like well i mean the real reason hillary clinton didn't win is because she had a baby that was an alien <laughs> say anything. Like, what uh, happened where how did we get here <laughs> so uh, i so yes. ultimately, so we look at CNET, we look at, uh, we look at, well, I mean, focusing with on the quarterling here, um, what would have been the better thing to do? Because if CNET, like maybe CNET accomplished their goal of getting bigger, you know, maybe they got the views, got paid. Better for who? That's the question. Like better for like. The best outcome did happen. It cost all of us negativity. But the best outcome, they both grew. So if, there's, if their goal is to be more endeared by their customers, mm -hmm. to make more money and to grow their platform and to be better at posting, right? So they had a chance to practice. They got to, to practice writing more articles. They got to, right? So if their goal mm -hmm. was to, to be more established in their in, in, you know, build their resume, make money, all of that, that all happened. That, that was, it, it already, the best outcomes already, the most optimal outcome according to like an algorithm has already been met. Okay. Because both sides, I think, grew out of this. I know that I went off and read multiple CNET articles, and I've ignored CNET for the last two years of my life. Um, and I did that to research for this. I said, like, well, I wonder if this is out of character for CNET. It's not. This article's right up their alley, and there's a reason that people at CNET are, are proud to, to call this a member of their, their staff. Like, this is, this is exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, now, what's the best outcome for like humanity as a whole? One of the <laughs> let's fix let's fix humanity right now. <laughs> to, to put a stop to it, to stop being a a, a child. Because what happened here is, Je uh, Jeremy made a mistake. He he chose to cover. He chose to say, "You went to school for something, and I didn't, and so I'm going to criticize you on it when it wouldn't take me very long at all or cost me money to go learn about it." He could have gotten a review copy of that game, I'm sure. Played it for four hours. And then, but there's a risk that at the end of that four hours, he would have gone, oh, she's right. And then now he's just wasted four hours. He can't put out a piece because mm -hmm. all he does is agree with her. Right. So it's a whole lot easier to say, okay, how about I invest no time, no hours, and I criticize her. That's way easier and I can make money at it. Mm -hmm. And then they hit back, probably harder than they should have. Um, coming out and publicly saying like, isn't it, you know, basically saying like, isn't it awesome that I can withdraw advertisers because I'm better than them? Well, and the thing is, is that did these advertisers blacklist the quarterling or did they just say, don't run my stuff on gaming? You know, and if that's the case, then Jeremy wins, CNET wins, gamers on the YouTube platform all lose because now Honda's like not running ads anywhere. Now we don't know how they have the, the those controls to say like, Anything that's tagged or in this category, block. 
I'm sure they now have the power to individually block certain channels. And honestly, I think in the long run of it, I doubt that they have anybody coming back and saying, let me just remove that white, you know, that, 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 that block. If it's especially, if it's especially a certain channel, I think if they blacklisted all of gaming, then it's just going to be a matter to see if this blows up. And if it doesn't, then eventually they're like, well, we, we know that gamers need cars. Why, why are we giving Toyota a hundred percent of that? That influence. Why did we Coca-Cola leaves Pepsi is nothing but a, a field day. Like why is why are all YouTubers wearing Pepsi shirts? Like you know the next generation grows up and has no concept that there's a thing called Coca-Cola. They just order a soda. Hey, can I get a Coke? What flavor? Pepsi, please. You know Pepsi's the best with Thai food, by the way. Not a sponsor, but if they'd like to be, <laughs> you're my beverage of choice with Thai food. Ugh. Not, uh, not a work to give thing. I don't like delicious. Pepsi. Dr. Pepper, man. That's all. Everything starts and ends with Dr. Pepper. Not sponsored. Uh, so, uh, so uh, brought to you in no way reimbursed to us by anybody. Uh, uh, but no, it's like, I think ultimately the question is that, you know, what the hell? Like, <laughs> um, is there... I think the solution doesn't come down with the creators. I think the creators respond to the market, right? They respond to what people want. So the real thing I would say, if this was ever, if this is going to become an exploratory piece, if Jeremy, uh, you know, I guess figures out what happened with the schedule and um, we, we sit down with him, is that is there a solution to the, to the aiming uh, angry gaming culture? And I think it has to do with just, how some of these companies run like when we talk about and bash ea and activision and these different things like the the because i don't think when i watch uh, these guys and when i was watching them especially more intently for the research for this podcast that is now a discussion topic um is that i don't i, I don't see them as thinking them as they don't perceive themselves as angry or hateful people i think they are consumer advocates i think they Look at themselves, and especially with the the size of uh, of the audiences that, that they they have they have currently and that continue to grow, is that they are their job is to speak up for this these consumers. That they are angry, they are tired of microtransactions, they are tired of loot boxes, they are tired of having ideas and philosophies and different things like that maybe shoved down their throats, and that essentially makes them the the hero of the narrative. And I'm not saying they aren't heroes, but it depends on really like anybody's like, we're going to piss everybody off with this discussion because at some point someone's like, I agree with Brian. And then Brian went, goes this direction and it's like, Brian's an idiot. I just agreed with them. Like there's a lot of, I think there's going to be a lot of turmoil um, in terms of like inner eyes, people like process this, but that's the point of this video. And that's the point of what we hope to accomplish and what we want to see from creators in this space is more discussion regardless of like ideologies and whether we agree or not it's that you know sitting down having these kind of conversations um to i not necessarily to, to make everybody who's watching agree but it's just to sit here and say like you know there is nuance you know there is this kind of this perspective could it is it reasonable to say that x x y and z yeah i i think both sides both sides made mistakes um in tone mm -hmm. in this and and not because it was not in their best interest to do so it wasn't i don't think it was an accident at all uh it may not have been as intentional to cause the damage they did but i, I think everything was at least intentional at the time it was done yeah um even if they later looked back and said mm, maybe should have said that a little differently right uh, and so i i think that there was definitely some tone here and, and ultimately it feels like it feels like me and my brother bickering in the backseat of the car and mm. it doesn't really matter which one of us hit the other one first which one of us slighted the other one first whether the first slight was intentional or the second slight was intentional or or any of it was done vindictively either way my dad was going to turn around and say i will hit both of you don't knock it off but there is no parent in this situation and now cnet chooses to be the one who self-proclaims themselves as the adult in the relationship they self-proclaim, we are established, we are a real media outlet held to journalistic principles by professionals who have journalism degrees, and we have a PR team, and lawyers, and editors, and all of this, and that makes us better. So of the two, because they chose to hold themselves to that standard, as opposed to Jeremy, who makes it abundantly clear, I haven't quit my day job, I just really like talking about games, 
if you're going to set your standard up that high, CNET should have been the bigger adult in this situation and said, you know what? I don't care if this guy wants to badmouth somebody's review when he didn't play the game. I'm just going to let it go. Mm -hmm. uh, if your fear is that giving negativity a platform will breed more negativity, talking about him did that. Yeah. So you're part of your own self-diagnosed problem. Um, so I think that's really where it comes down to. And I don't know how you tackle it. There's nothing actionable about this piece. Like we were laying out this podcast and I've, I've watched a ton of Jeremy's videos back to back to back. So my feed is filled. So like I knew before this, what the, watching that does to your algorithm. And I'm telling you, it's done it to my algorithm. And so I watched a ton of his pieces um, just to make sure I was up to speed on like some of his past pieces, some of the pieces referenced in these articles. And then I went off and read a bunch of CNET and like, it, it kind of, they, they both are just being themselves. I didn't see anything out of character here. Mm -hmm. And so if there was a, an attempt to be a character assassination, I don't think that was done at all. And I think both are succeeding as a result of this. So like, it just felt like an immovable object hit an unstoppable force and they're just going to both go on their merry way now. Yeah. I think I, my, a lot of my stuff comes from, a, I guess, just a kind of a gut feeling that all of this kind of gave me. And it's that the the implications that it's YouTube that picks the top results in the shirts and it's YouTube that recommends the next video to watch is that this seemed to be, and I don't think it was timed that way, but obviously with the quote unquote Vox apocalypse, et cetera, is that every time that we can bash on this, this platform called YouTube and financially hurt them, we're going to find that angle. And it was only a matter of time before that angle came into something that we have ourselves in our channel have already pointed out. Why are there so many? Like, why why is this a thing? And it's that, you know, it's the old principle of the echo chamber. YouTube, its job is to keep you on the platform that will keep you wanting to watch movie, you know, like uh, videos. Like, to say that it, it doesn't, it would be weird. It's like if YouTube is like, hey, it's time that you go and maybe read this book or you know it's like no please don't we don't want to get paid like no of course they do youtube is the second biggest search engine in the world you know it's google overall but it's like within within the google search engine youtube is still a search engine because it has all of this content and has all this stuff etc and so i don't ultimately know what what they want it's not like youtube is getting smaller and it's not like this. the the old media is getting bigger. In fact, the opposite's having. And the question is, is that is this just a, like the, the 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 final throws of you know of somebody falling into irrelevance? It's like yeah, they're they're gonna fall into it and they're gonna pat themselves on the back the whole time. Like look at us, take it to the YouTubers. You know, look at us. <laughs> like we've got our journalistic degrees, and some guy in his basement, you know, commands more uh, more attention and watch time. Um, you know, because he like he legitimately maybe understands the, the, the audience and the community that he speaks to because, you know, it, it, it has that intimacy level where the, the, the scene at Arkle does not, you know, like I can see Jeremy. I can't see Ian. I think that's his name who wrote the article. Um, I, I, you know, you see him, you see them talking, you can develop that. Like you could you said you could watch hundreds of hours of Philip DeFranco and you could have this automatic like, oh, like, yeah, that's Philip, et cetera. He's never seen you, you know, it's like ever, you know, so it's, it's the same way with the work to game community. It's that, you know, it's all, and that's why I'm really looking forward <laughs> to our event coming up. But the, the foundational thing is, is that that's the feeling. I don't have evidence of it. You know, I don't know whether like how these, these, these media companies are, are coming or going, but I know they keep trying to break into YouTube, but mm -hmm. it's very difficult for them because they have this high production cost, they have this high cost up front, and they don't have that sense of intimacy, that that personalization that YouTube actually can command through its through its value. And so your kind of point at the beginning is that the the psychology is is that the number next to the subscriber count equals influence. I don't think it, of it that way. I look at when I like, but that's me, Brian, as an individual. I like, oh, you've got you know millions of subs. That's great. I'm going to watch your content and then I'm going to judge it and I'm going to have that, my thoughts rock around the content. I'm somebody who does that, but there are people in this world and there's no, I don't know if there's any solution for it who look at the thumbnail, who look at the title of an article and they get their truth from that. That's where I think a lot of people, you know, when people call us negative, it's like if they call yeah. us negative and they've watched the video, that's a conversation. I'm really interested in that feedback. But if they just look at the, like the thumbnail, 
that's asking a question. It's not usually, we're not usually having the thumbnail make a statement of fact. It's usually asking a question and then they say that's a negative video because of that. I have to wonder like, do they only get their information from, you know, the, the headlines? You know, like if you only live off that, like you go, you can go into Facebook for the, for living off of headlines. Thousands of things get shared off the headline alone. And if people just derive their truth from it, like what can you do? And so ultimately, the goal is is that as creators in the space for us, like how I look at it and how I make the content, is a, a level of responsibility in how we present that information. And that's why we try to have our videos, you, you know, like not be artificially positive. But the fact is, is that we are sitting down talking about video games. It's ultimately a joyful experience. Like I could, you know, <laughs> we like any other generation, we could be at war with something. We could be, you know, like there could be famine. There could be all kinds of things. Guess what? It's 2019. And did you guys, are you excited about Super Mario Maker 2? Because I am legitimately excited about it. I'm excited for my kids to experience it. I am excited because Maddie and her experience already with the Secret of Mana is light years above that. People can sit here and, <laughs> and critique games and say it's not as good as it was, but I think it's better than it's ever been. And that's just the perspective because I get to look at it from my nostalgia and I also get to see it from the, the, the next generation who's looking at these video games and they're just blown away. And, I'm, and, and I can't wait for them to see some of the things that I already know exist and they have no clue. You know, it's like, <laughs> like, oh, cool. I'm playing this, this character and it's got a sword. Like, just wait, there's a sequel. You don't know it yet. I'm not telling you because you're five years old. But after we do this. Then we can talk about Kingdom Hearts 3, which is going to blow your mind. <laughs> anyway. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I would have been interested to have kind of Jeremy's perspective on this. Um, just as a fellow YouTuber, like, he puts out a ton of content. Uh, and as much as he self-proclaims, like, I don't want to quit my day job for this, like, he clearly cares about his channel. Mm -hmm. um, he clearly cares about his audience. And I don't think either side lost sleep over this. I think both sides feel they were in the right. Um, I you know, in a perfect world, we would be big enough to then ask CNET on and and, and see their side of things. Um, That's a goal. I, That's something I like. In, when in general, I would I would tend to think that that CNET did more wrong in this relationship. Yeah. Same way that I was often held to a higher standard if I was in a fight with my little brothers, regardless of who started it. Yes. Because I was the one that was to be held to a higher standard. And it's not about being fair. It's about that I knew better. I knew, that first of all, I was bigger. So I knew that when my brother hit me as hard as he could, I could hurt him way worse than he could hurt me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pulling an advertiser from somebody, a YouTube channel, is way more hurtful than anything we can do to a publication as large as CNET. And, and you know, so I can hit him way harder than he can hit yeah. me. This and is seen at punching I, down. I have been taught, I have been taught way more times to be the adult in the room and to know that if yeah. I don't have anything nice to say, to just to just be quiet. And so, like, I should have known that, like, hey, if I want to have this discussion with them, we can have an email, we can have this. I, I have lawyers. I could send them cease and desist. Like, we could do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But instead, like, not only did I choose to like let him make it public. But I then chose to go tweet about it. And like Twitter, Twitter honestly was the tool that really made this different for me. If it had just been CNET articles and YouTube videos, it's like, oh, you're both staying in your lane. Mm -hmm. Do you? But when they started meeting in that neutral ground and, and the author of the article started tweeting things out, that's where I felt that it's like you've dropped your professionalism. I know you think that your Twitter is, is yours because you're not at work. But you know what we see you as? A chief editor at CNET. Uh, and so you need to act like one in all circumstances. So invent another Twitter handle if you want to go off and, and rip gamers um, outside of the professionalism of CNET. Yeah, CNET punched down in this case, mm -hmm. in my opinion, especially when you, it's like if Jeremy was this, you know, you know, multi, you know, just if he's sitting here, just like he commands all of every gaming aspect of it. But this also then just beyond the growth, this gives him fuel that to justify and confirm his beliefs that they that old, old school media like you know the term he uses the journalist or whatever because it's like it get that only then reaffirms everything he says so it's like even if you're like okay i don't you know like he says this and that's fine they 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 legitimized him even more so in this way cnet punch down this jeremy can punch up at cnet for the it's next the four you know. years like he can hit them once a week on anything they write 
yeah. do any like and and tear it down and and the evidence is that look at what they, they attacked they attacked me like you know i'm sitting here over here just you know giving my opinion being a consumer advocate for games telling people how it is we hear that like i'm just telling it how it is not from him but i heard somebody say that and it, that, that that phrase just makes me laugh you know i'm just keeping it real like okay <laughs> um but it's like they they literally have they, they, they've set him up. Jeremy and the Quarterling, I could easily see. like Almost like how we got Creator on the Rise, I could easily see that like if there was a study from this point until the next, like this just accelerates him to becoming uh, you know, the, one of the probably the biggest uh, you know, platform, one of the biggest uh, commentators of gaming in his, genre. In, the, in, in, his, in, his, in his in his space. And so more power to him, guys, uh, regardless of what you, whether you like him or not. Um, you know, his information, his links are in the, in the thing below. Hopefully we can get, figure out what went wrong with the schedule. And if he's still interested in coming on and sharing his story, answering kind of our questions, because I would love to know his personal kind of opinion about this kind of in a real discussion way. That's the whole point of doing these discussion videos. Uh, and if there's any other topics out there that you guys would like to, to for us to dive into, please let us know in the comments below. Um, we're always interested in having interesting conversations um, you know, about really anything. Like I'll talk to anybody about anything, uh, ultimately. Uh, Chris, do you get any final thoughts? No, no, I think this was, um, this was, it was neat to talk about this with you. We don't usually spend this long kind of researching something, especially outside of our typical topic. I mean, even when we're researching something about a game, Brian and I both have decades of gaming experience. And so mm -hmm. talking about gaming comes really natural before you even introduce the passion. Um, and so this was definitely interesting. I know it's way outside of our normal content. Um, I, 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 I wish he had been here to kind of help. I, I had a lot of questions because like, I, I am interested in, in really understanding because it's not a position that we've been in. And mm -hmm. so we're analyzing this as the very outsiders that we're accusing them of being. And so like, I know that like all these things, when they talk about principles and all this, I am not saying that Brian and I have never accidentally been hypocritical or accidentally been, you know, said something about something that we didn't do the research. But when you intentionally go out there and you say, I'm good because X, it's like, well, then you better deliver. Uh, and so that's, you know, there's, there's clearly on both sides yeah. an aw self-awareness. They talk about, you know, CNET talked about knowing that the algorithm was what was doing it, not Jeremy. And Jeremy, when he talks about things like murder and all that in COD, when he reads the article, he puts the article on the page. And as he reads, he skips over the more violent words and says, and they're being bad people. So if you listen to the audio, it's a more PG version. And so like, they're clearly both self-aware. Um, and saying, oh, I'm not going to do this because this industry is too volatile. Well, you know that your type of channel is volatile, right? So like just because you operated inside the rules, like, oh, I stepped out into the road in a crosswalk and the car hit me. It's his it's his fault because I was in a crosswalk. It's like, yes, but you know that getting hit by a car is still going to it's it's not going to be great. <laughs> uh, like it doesn't matter who's right. Mm -hmm. You still got hit by a car and you know that you're doing an activity that that does lead to people getting hit by cars, whether you're right or not. Right. Uh, and so like being that self-aware, I think is a really intriguing part of this. Um, and so it'd be interesting to kind of hear them say like, well, then what made you do it anyway? You knew that this is how they would respond. You right. knew that you did this, they would respond this way. Um, I don't know. Interesting. It's a weird world. Thanks guys so much for watching for work to game. My name is Brian. My name is Chris. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you soon. Nice. Take care. Hey, it's me. It's been a while since I talked to you guys directly this way, but don't tell anybody. We've got even more epic content planned for this channel. The response has been incredible. We hope to see you. If you're new, hit subscribe, leave us a comment. I'd like to talk to you more about video games. I can't seem to speak my language. <laughs> All right.